Hi everyone, it's Katrina. The Baalbek Stones Baalbek is an ancient Phoenician city located in what is today Lebanon, just north of Beirut. It was inhabited as far back as 9000 BC and grew to be one of the major pilgrimage sites in the ancient world. But of course, these weren't Buddhist or Islamic pilgrims. They were worshipping a different god. People came from all over the land to give praise to the sky god Baal. The city's name actually translates to Lord Baal of the Beka Valley. In the very center of the great city was an enormous temple dedicated to Baal and his consort Astarte. Even all these years later, the ruins of the temple are still there. But here is the mystery that scientists have never been able to solve. The city of Baalbek was built using giant stones. The foundation cornerstones weigh about 100 tons each. The retaining wall was built of even bigger monolithic stones, weighing over 300 tons. Nobody has any clue how the ancient people of Phoenicia managed to move the stones, or how they could even transport them to the city. One of the blocks was discovered a mile away, weighing 900 tons. When the Romans arrived about 2,000 years ago, they used the original stones as foundations for their own buildings and temples. Even they couldn't figure out how the Phoenicians had manipulated the building blocks. Some say they could have only been moved using something like a spaceship or a great piece of modern machinery. And even after decades of study, scientists are still confused. The Nazca Landing Strips The Nazca Lines in Peru have been a mystery to archaeologists ever since they were discovered in the middle of the desert in the 1920s. The Nazca Lines are a group of geoglyphs drawn on the ground to create the huge shapes of animals and things that look like monsters. They can be found about 250 miles south of Lima and were created by the Nazca culture 2,000 years ago. What's truly unusual about this historical art is that the images can only be seen from above. This has led to a lot of speculation as to why and how they were built. If the locals couldn't even see them without hovering in the air above, what was the point? In total, there are over 300 designs covering the desert, including representations of at least 70 animals and plants. Some of them measure a whopping 1,200 feet long. There is also one particularly strange geoglyph that appears to show a human figure dressed like an astronaut. We know the lines were created beginning in the year 100 BC. Each geoglyph was made by removing about 15 inches of rock to reveal the lightly colored sand beneath. The geoglyphs started out small and got bigger as the Nazca learned what they were doing. In the early 1940s, American historian Paul Kosuk studied the lines and determined they had some connection to astrology. After that, the German archaeologist Maria Reich suggested the animal geoglyphs were meant to represent groups of stars in the sky. As we moved into the 60s and 70s, researchers began to suggest they were made as markers for alien visitors. These theories are pretty wild, saying that aliens helped build the lines as part of a great landing strip for their huge space vehicles. But of course, that's probably not the case. Right now, the best guess scientists have is that the lions were made for some unknown ritual astrological purpose. Glastonbury Tor Some historians believe Glastonbury Tor is the burial site for the mythical King Arthur. Obviously, there's a lot of skepticism surrounding this theory. Nobody knows if King Arthur was a real person, and his burial site has never actually been found here. Glastonbury Tor is a hill in England topped by St. Michael's Tower, which was built in the 14th century. It's a famous landmark in Somerset, thought of as one of England's most spiritual sites. Excavations have revealed habitation going back to the days of the Neolithic people. Archaeologists have found flint tools, Roman artifacts, and other relics spanning a period of over 5,000 years. They even found proof that an original church was built in 1275, but destroyed probably by an earthquake, before the more recent Church of St. Michael was constructed over its ruins. Ever since the 12th century, Glastonbury Tor and the legend of King Arthur have gone hand in hand. In 1191, King Arthur's and Queen Guinevere's coffins were allegedly discovered here and then lost. But historians don't believe it. They think it was just a hoax to increase the area's popularity. The truth is that we don't know just how important this area was 800 years ago. If King Arthur was real, perhaps he was buried here. However, no tomb of any sort has ever been discovered. Secret Underground Tunnels of Mesopotamia Ani is a mysterious Armenian city whose origin dates back 5,000 years. During the days of Mesopotamia, Ani was renowned for being a city of great splendor and magnificence. It was called the City of Forty Gates, 
and the city of 1001 churches. It was also said to rival cities like Constantinople and Cairo. In the 11th century, Ani had a population of roughly 100,000 people. In the years that followed, it became a battleground for the warring empires of Europe and was ultimately abandoned and destroyed. Today, the ruins of Christian churches, temples used by Zoroastrians, and crumbled structures archaeologists can't even identify litter the hilltop city. And here's something interesting. In the 1880s, an underground portion of the city was discovered. Archaeologists found a tunnel which led to a labyrinth of corridors, cells, and massive rooms seemingly without purpose. A text was discovered in one of the rooms written in an ancient Armenian language, proving the underground city was very old. Today, we know of at least 823 subterranean structures underneath the ruins of Ani. These structures include stables, monasteries, tombs, and dwellings. And yet nobody has been able to figure out why such a great and prosperous city had a secret underground portion. It's a mystery thousands of years old that will probably never be solved. Band of Holes In Peru, archaeologists discovered a strip of land about a mile long covered in mysterious holes. The holes are shallow, almost like unused graves. Experts have been researching these holes for decades, with little to no success. This strange site is called simply Band of Holes. The holes were first discovered in 1931 when pilots started flying over the area. Nearly a century later, we're not much closer to finding out their origin. What we do know is that the holes were dug about 500 years ago in the 15th century. Each one is 3 feet wide and less than 4 feet deep. They also weren't carved out of the ground exactly, but were constructed using soil and rocks brought in from somewhere else. Looking at it from the outside, it doesn't make too much sense. In total, there are over 5,000 of them. Here are the most entertaining theories. Some say aliens, with the holes being left by some kind of propulsion system when they took off from the ground. But a more grounded theory is that the holes were part of an ancient Inca tax system. Archaeologists Charles Stanish and Henry Tantalian from the University of California say the pits were used as measuring devices for redistributing food. People would have had to bring their food and dump it into these holes, and then it was redistributed to people in the kingdom like some kind of early communist program. What do you think these mysterious holes were used for? Let me know in the comments below. Big shout out to Oliver F. Rupert and Lily Lipstick. Thanks so much for your support and for spending time with us. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe to join the Origins Explained family. Ancient Abu Dhabi In Abu Dhabi, archaeologists with the Department of Culture and Tourism recently discovered the earliest known building anywhere in the United Arab Emirates. The building has been dated to 8,500 years old. This makes it 500 years older than anything else ever found here. The ruin was uncovered on Gaga Island. Almost 10,000 years ago, this place wouldn't have been the inhospitable desert it is today. It would have been a fertile coastline, one so enticing the Neolithic hunters settled down and built some of the very first human settlements. Before the discovery of this ruin, the oldest structure in the UAE was on the island of Marawa. Looking at both of these discoveries, it's pretty clear that the islands near Abu Dhabi were a gathering point for early humans. But that's about as much as we know about the ancient people who lived here. The ruin is nothing more than a few crumbling walls. Nobody knows who made it, how long the community on the island lasted, or where they went after. Rocky Gari At the beginning of the 20th century, there weren't really any archaeological records of what happened in India between the Stone Age and the Dark Age. But then came the discovery of the Harappan culture, pushing back civilization in India over 2,000 years. We now know about the cities of Dolavira, Mohenjo-daro, and Rakigari. These were the major hubs for the Bronze Age Harappan, giant cities surrounded by agricultural settlements and filled with skilled craftsmen. In total, archaeologists have identified at least 2,000 sites related to the civilization. Mohenjo-daro was considered the biggest at over 300 hectares until the year 2020. That was when 11 mysterious mounds were found in Rakigari spanning an area of at least 550 hectares. This site appears to be the biggest, but it's only been 5% excavated. Nobody has any idea what its significance was, why there's barely anything left except a handful of buried ruins, or how it fits in with India's ancient history. That being said, it's not that surprising that archaeologists are confused. The Harappan civilization is believed to have existed for only 1,300 years. 
They appeared in 3300 BC and disappeared into thin air in 2000 BC. Almost everything they built has already deteriorated and been lost to time. The Cremated Remains of the Buddha In a small Chinese village, archaeologists discovered the cremated remains of someone in the ruins of a temple. The remains were found inside a ceramic box with a very mysterious inscription on it. The inscription says that the ashes in the box belong to Buddha himself, Siddhartha Gautama. They were gathered by monks of the Lotus School from the Longxing Monastery. Over 2,000 cremated fragments of the Buddha were collected, along with his bones and teeth, and buried in the hall of the temple on June 22, 1013. Along with the box, archaeologists also found over 260 Buddhist statues. All of these artifacts were hidden underneath the ruins of what is believed to be Manjusri Temple. Here's where science and history get a little complicated. The Buddha was a very real person who died 2,500 years ago. But according to reputable sources, this wasn't the only discovery ever made of some human remains alleged to belong to the Buddha. A skull bone was discovered inside a gold chest in China a few years ago, also from the Buddha. It happens all the time. This case is a little different because the remains are cremated. They were also gathered over a period of 20 years by a pair of monks named Yun Chiang and Shi Ming. We know that Buddha was cremated at Kushinagar, but what happened to those ashes afterwards is a total mystery. They could be in the box, or they could be somewhere else. Germany's Ring Sanctuary There are unexplained mass graves located at what some have called the Stonehenge of Germany. It's located in Pomelte and has been found to contain evidence of ritual human sacrifice. The site itself is a ring-shaped sanctuary composed of circular ditches, earth walls, and tall wooden pillars. It was built about 4,000 years ago in the Early Bronze Age and had most likely been used for astronomy, the same as Stonehenge in England. Things probably weren't exactly the same, but the rituals were undoubtedly quite similar. But here's where the two sites are very different. At the Ring Sanctuary in Germany, archaeologists have identified the remains of over 35 longhouses in which the ancient people once lived. But at Stonehenge, researchers have never actually found tangible proof of houses. That means that people were living right here along the outskirts of the sanctuary. Plus, pits of bodies were discovered in the German sanctuary site. It's unclear if the people found in the pits were victims of sacrifice, but archaeologist Andre Spatzier thinks so. The thing is that no adult male bodies have ever been found in the burial pits. The only bodies have been those of women and children. As sad as it is, these were normally the people to be sacrificed by Neolithic people to their gods. What's unknown is why the people died, and if they were sacrificed, what the point was. This was supposedly a place of astrology. It makes you wonder if our ancient ancestors weren't sacrificing people to the stars in the sky. The Truth of the Crystal Skulls there's nothing quite as supernatural in the field of archaeology as a crystal skull. For that matter, no other archaeological artifacts are quite as controversial. Throughout the world, there are dozens of very rare crystal skulls stored in public collections and stashed away in private ones. Some of them are crystal clear, some of them are smoky colored, and they all come in different shapes and sizes. Most are believed to have come from Mexico or Central America many hundreds of years ago. But what's the truth behind the crystal skulls? Were they really carved by an unknown civilization that predates the Maya and the Aztec? Are they proof of extraterrestrial visitors before the Spanish ever arrived in the Americas? The answer depends on who you ask. Joshua Shapiro, one of the authors of Mysteries of the Crystal Skulls Revealed, says these skulls are ancient computers created by aliens that are able to record energy. If unlocked, the skulls can replay events and images based on who has come into contact with them. Archaeologists say that this is nonsense. Michael Smith from Arizona State University says these skulls were simply pieces of art made by the Aztec. In the Aztec pantheon of gods, many were represented by skulls. To invoke the power of these gods, they simply carved skulls out of whatever aesthetically appealing and impressive materials they could find. But here's the most shocking truth of all. According to the British Museum and the Smithsonian Institution, there are no crystal skulls. The British Museum did a study and found that all of the crystal skulls they could get a hold of stored in museums were carved as recently as the late 19th century. There has never been a crystal skull found, officially, at any archaeological excavation. 
The Chanquillo Observatory Complex The Chanquillo Observatory Complex in Peru features a whopping 13 stone towers. These towers were built between 250 and 200 BC, just over 2,000 years ago. They are considered an advanced ancient technology because these stone towers functioned as a calendar, marking the rise and fall of the sun during different times of the year. It's actually considered the oldest solar observatory anywhere in the Americas. Scientists have called it a masterpiece of human creative genius. And yet despite its amazing stature and serious historical relevance, pretty much nobody has heard of it. The site wasn't even added to the list of global cultural monuments until 2021. These days, the towers don't exactly look like towers. They look more like the bumpy bones of some great dragon's spine crawling up a ridge, which also looks somewhat like the back of a sleeping dragon. They've crumbled and fallen quite a bit since ancient times, now just small shrunken remnants of what they once were. Still, the foundations are there, and if you use your imagination, you can see just how splendid they would have been 2,300 years ago. They functioned as a calendar by marking the equinoxes and solstices, while also keeping track of the exact time of year within one or two days. Unlike places like Stonehenge, Chanquillo was created on a huge scale. Stonehenge and other ancient observatories used circles and big blocks of stone as calendars. But this ancient civilization, now called the Chanquillo Society, took it a step further and used imposing towers and a much larger space. It was something that took great knowledge of both the cosmos and mathematics. The Hydraulic Telegraph According to the ancient Greek historian Polybius, a man named Aeneas Tacticus invented the hydraulic telegraph over 2,000 years ago in 350 BC. It was the first long-distance communication system, originally employed during the First Punic War to send messages from Sicily to Carthage. It was a pretty ingenious invention, and arguably the most efficient way to get a message from one place to another in a hurry. The system worked like this. On the top of separate hills, there would be a container filled with water and a vertical rod floating inside it. The rod was inscribed with various codes. In order to send a message, the operator would use a torch to signal the receiver on another hill within view. Once the two were synchronized, they would begin draining their buckets at the exact same time. They would stop draining their buckets as soon as the sender lowered their torch. Then, wherever the water level was, that was the message. The issue here is that the hydraulic telegraph could only be used on days of good weather, and when the sender and receiver were within sight of each other. They could also only have so many predetermined messages already written on the vertical rod. Still, it was a genius invention that didn't see any improvements until the 19th century in Britain, nearly 2200 years later. The Surgeon's Tomb in Peru, the highly advanced yet oddly terrifying surgical kit of an ancient doctor was discovered inside a tomb. The doctor's surgical kit contained what at first glance looked like primitive weapons, knives and needles and sharp metallic tools. The truth is that many of these surgical instruments played two roles, being used in medical surgeries and in human sacrifices. But perhaps the most boggling part is that the surgeon almost certainly used these tools and his advanced knowledge of surgical techniques to perform operations on people's brains. The surgeon lived 1,000 years ago during what is known as the Middle Sea Khan period of between 900 and 1050. He was buried underneath the ceremonial temple at the Huaca Las Ventanas archaeological site, which goes to show he had a very high standing in the community. He was part of the Sikan culture, also known as the Lambayeque culture, and although some might consider them primitive barbarians for the way they sacrificed their own people, they were also extremely advanced when it came to medical science. According to the director of the Sican National Museum, Carlos Elera, along with surgical knives and other instruments, archaeologists also found two frontal bones with marks on them. These marks indicate that they were cut using trepanation techniques. In other words, the frontal bones were trophies from human skull surgery. Carlos says this likely means the surgeon was an expert in cranial trepanations, using his knives to cut into people's skulls and relieve pressure on their brains. 
Pont du Gard. During the Roman Empire, aqueducts went up all across Europe. They were used to transport the most important liquid on the planet from one point to another. It took a lot of engineering prowess to design the aqueducts, bringing drinkable water to cities that otherwise wouldn't have had any access. The aqueduct was one of the big things, along with major highways, responsible for the success of the Roman Empire. And there is no greater example of the architectural genius of the aqueduct than Pont du Gard in France. Today, Pont du Gard is the best preserved aqueduct anywhere in Europe. It was designed to supply running water for everything from drinking to cooking to waste disposal to the city of Nemausis 2,000 years ago. It's extraordinary because it's still standing and because it's massive. This structure stands over 150 feet tall. It's over 1,500 feet wide, and it's in better shape than some bridges built in the 20th century. It doesn't seem like anything will topple this unbelievable feat of engineering. Not even the millions of tourists who climb all over it every year. Roman Nanotech Even more impressive than the greatness of the Roman aqueducts is Roman nanotechnology. That's right, nanotechnology. Recent evidence has come to light that Roman craftsmen figured out how to use nanotech to change the color of things when exposed to different light. The evidence comes in the form of a goblet, what's called the Lycurgus cup. It looks like an ordinary glass drinking cup, but it's unique in the fact that it uses microscopic technology to change its exterior color. The unique properties were first noticed when it was brought to a museum over 70 years ago. But it wasn't until recently that scientists were able to actually figure out how the color changes. First of all, the goblet was made 1600 years ago. The process behind its creation is incredibly complex. Tiny particles of gold and silver were embedded inside the glass. When it's sitting in normal lighting, the glass is a jade color. But when it's lit from behind, the green turns to a ruby red. It does this because when hit by light from behind, photons hit the electrons and cause them to vibrate, thereby changing the color. It's doubtful the Romans realized they were working with nanotechnology. However, they clearly knew they were onto something. The Romans probably ground metal particles and then mixed them with hot liquid glass to create the cup. And although they knew the result, they probably didn't understand why. Otherwise, there would be a lot more surviving examples of this sort of nanotechnology. The Viking Sword of the Future The mysterious Ulfbert swords of the Vikings were created using technology from the future. In fact, these ancient weapons have boggled archaeologists for years, with experts confused as to how medieval Vikings made them. The issue is that Vikings forged these swords using technology that didn't appear for another thousand years after they were gone. The swords all date between the 9th and 11th centuries, forged during a transitional period between primitive Viking weaponry and the more advanced swords used by medieval knights. Thousands of them were dispersed across Europe, though only around 100 are preserved today, most of them pulled from Viking burials. Even more mysterious is that after 1100 AD, the swords vanished, and nothing with even a remotely similar quality surfaced again until the 18th century. All the swords were inscribed with the name Ulfbert, which archaeologists think was a kind of ancient brand name. However, nobody can agree on if this was the name of the place the weapons were made or the name of the person who came up with the technology. Now let's look at why they were so special. The metal of the blades has been compared in strength and quality to modern-day steel. Before the appearance of these swords, Viking blades were made of low-quality steel that shattered like glass. Then, from out of nowhere, swords of the same quality as modern 21st century steel suddenly appeared. It's strange because blacksmiths shouldn't even have had the technology to heat the iron ore enough to create such magnificent steel. They would have needed ovens heated to over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. How do you think they did this? Let me know your theories in the comments below. Bronze Age Super Thread People in the Bronze Age figured out how to make super thread, a highly advanced thread used in fashioning everything from clothing to building materials. 3,800 years ago, in both Britain and across Europe, thread making became abruptly popular. It was a huge technological leap forward, moving from the primitive draft spinning of plant fibers to a process called splicing. 
According to Dr. Margarita Gleba from the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research, the invention of splicing marked a major turning point in civilization. Even more interesting is that a new study has shown that it wasn't only the pre-dynastic Egyptians who figured out how to make perfect textiles, but also Bronze Age Europeans. Here's why it was such a huge step forward for civilization. Draft spinning, which was a process of drawing out fibers from a mass and then twisting them using a rotating spindle, occurred at the exact same time as the first human urbanization and the first real population growths happened. It also coincided directly with major human migration across the Mediterranean region. Learning how to create strong textiles allowed for faster and bigger ships, and for the quicker processing of materials. It was one of the first real technologies that allowed humans to go further than they ever had before. Technology spreads disease. The discovery of a parasitic egg inside of a grave 6,200 years old has proven something a little strange. The parasitic egg is direct evidence of an unintended side effect of the first agricultural irrigation systems in the Middle East. It would appear that with the birth of irrigation in Syria over 6,000 years ago, ancient people managed to inadvertently spread disease with more effectiveness than ever before. The parasitic egg would have eventually hatched into a flatworm parasite, something that lives in the blood vessels inside the bladder and intestines. People infected with this kind of parasite suffer from a disease called schistosomiasis. It causes all kinds of nasty issues from bladder cancer to kidney failure. But up until the introduction of crop irrigation in ancient Mesopotamia, it wasn't a very big issue. Man-made technology was responsible for the first major disease outbreaks. According to Dr. Pierce Mitchell from the University of Cambridge, Whoever contracted the parasite had done so through the use of irrigation systems. Before 7,500 years ago, the parasite was restricted to living its early life inside freshwater snails, and then attaching onto people who went swimming in the water. The parasite would burrow into the skin and then cause the disease, but the irrigation systems distributed the water to crops, which were then distributed to the masses, giving the parasites a thousand new avenues of infection. They could now infect people without having to wait for them to go swimming. They were distributed by the irrigation system to everyone with a vengeance. The Ancient Maya Road System One of the greatest technologies implemented by the Maya people was a system of highways that linked their great empire together. These roads were called sakbe, and they were quite a bit different from the roads being paved in ancient Rome. The Maya roads were made of huge stones overlaid with rubble, and over top of the rubble were cylindrical stones and smooth layers of stucco. This created actual highways, wide stretches of primitive pavement about four feet above ground level. In some parts of the swampy empire, the roads could be as tall as eight feet to get over the marshy terrain. One of the biggest issues when trying to determine just how vast the Maya road system was is that pretty much all of it is gone. 1,100 years later, the same wild jungles that have swallowed most of the Maya ruins have also swallowed their technologically advanced roadways. So far, the longest one discovered stretches a distance of 60 miles from between Koba and Yashuna, but historians think some of the longer ones were at least 100 miles in length. And while that may not seem like a lot, it's pretty big. Keep in mind that the Maya civilization itself covered an area of 325,000 square miles. They used these raised roads to connect ceremonial centers with rural communities and major cities with each other. It allowed people to move through treacherous jungle terrain far more easily, which helped with everything from trade to warfare. The Dendera Light The Dendera Light is either the first evidence of a light bulb being used in Egypt or just a really coincidental artistic rendering of a mythical snake in a womb. The light isn't a physical artifact, but a stone relief at the Hathor Temple, which itself is located in the temple complex of Dendera. The depiction shows what appears to be a very long electric bulb with a wire in it and a filament, being wielded by an unknown pharaoh or a servant. It's hard to say. The light bulb, which looks like a modern cathode ray tube, also appears to be connected via a long wire to a battery. At first glance, it really does look like a light bulb. 
Fringe researchers claim it proves that the Egyptians figured out how to create a light bulb thousands of years before anyone else. The truth might be a little less exciting. Egyptologists believe it's all just a coincidence. They say the snake inside the light bulb is actually the serpent god Sematawi. He is rising from a lotus flower, which appears to be the base of the bulb. The flower's stalk is what's supposedly a wire connected to a power source. But as for the bulb around the snake, that's just supposed to represent Nut's womb. Nut is the goddess of night. With all these things put together, the relief is really just a depiction of the rising sun conquering night via the snake god rising through the lotus and being born from the night goddess's womb. It's a mouthful and probably the most convoluted way to draw a sunrise, but that's the ancient Egyptians for ya. Either they invented the light bulb, of which no physical proof has ever been found, or they just really liked complicated reliefs on their temple walls. The Jewel of Seren The Jewel of Seren, or the Joya de Seren in Spanish, is an archaeological site in El Salvador which features the ruins of an ancient farming village from the Maya civilization. It's not nearly as popular as many of the other Maya sites in Central America, yet it's shockingly well-preserved. Archaeologists even refer to it as the Pompeii of the Americas, because it's basically in the same state as it was 1,400 years ago. Also, just like Pompeii in Italy, the Jewel of Seren was blanketed by the ash of a nearby volcanic eruption. It happened in the year 600 AD, when the Loma Caldera blew its top and the settlement was buried under hot ashfall. After 400 years of human habitation, the place was lost in an instant. The buildings and people who didn't manage to escape were trapped under 30 feet of pyroclastic debris. It all happened in a matter of just hours. These days, the archaeological site is an amazing glimpse into the everyday life of the Maya. Everything is preserved just how it had been giving archaeologists a unique look into daily life. They've discovered plenty of houses made of mud and straw, ceremonial centers, and household objects. From excavations that have gone on since 1976, archaeologists have determined this was a pretty standard settlement. People here mainly harvested agave fibers and fruit and made pottery. They then traded amongst themselves and as well with some other settlements in the nearby area. It was much more of a homesteading community than a bustling trade center. While the fate of this town is sad, it presents a unique archaeological opportunity to get an accurate view of what life was like back in the day. Tomb of the Egyptian Queen In Egypt, archaeologists discovered a funerary temple dedicated to a queen from the Old Kingdom. The tomb contained over 50 wood sarcophagi, along with some ancient board games, strange wooden masks, and even a shocking copy of the Book of the Dead. Archaeologist and Egypt expert Zahi Hawass says the coffins date back to between 1570 and 1069 BC. They were pulled from 52 burial shafts that had been dug up to 40 feet deep in the earth. Each sarcophagus was found decorated with surreal paintings of ancient gods and scenes from Egyptian mythology. The coffins themselves were decorated with excerpts from the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead in this case wasn't actually a book, but a scroll 13 feet long. Written on the scroll are detailed instructions on how a deceased person should navigate the afterlife. It was essentially a welcome pamphlet for navigating the transition to the world beyond death. As for the queen, she was the wife of King Teti, the first ruler of the 6th dynasty. Her name was Queen Nart, and it was etched onto the wall of the temple as well as on a felled obelisk near the site of the burials. What's truly shocking is that up until now, Researchers and the public had never even heard of this queen. In order for her to have the entire temple dedicated to her means that she was probably someone of extreme importance. But this was 3,000 years ago, and the experts have yet to figure out why she was such a big deal to the ancient Egyptians. Why do you think this ancient queen's story was lost to time? Tell me your theories in the comments below. Coin of an Assassinated Emperor a rare gold coin was discovered in Hungary, with a very peculiar depiction on it. On one side of the coin is the face of a murdered Roman emperor named Volusianus. He ruled the Roman Empire in the 3rd century for two years with his father. He was more of a co-emperor without total power. However, Emperor Volusianus was assassinated at the young age of 22, and by his own soldiers. Because his reign was so short-lived, it's rare for a coin to be found with his picture on it. 
It's also incredibly rare for a gold coin from Rome to be discovered in Hungary. The details of this discovery get weirder still. Excavators were left scratching their heads when they only found this single coin. Normally, there would be a small hoard scattered throughout the site, but that's not the case. There was only one coin found in the entire area, meaning somebody probably lost it. According to archaeologist Mate Varga, whoever had accidentally misplaced the coin would have been devastated, as it was worth a small fortune. As for where the coin was found, it was dug up at an ancient Roman settlement somewhere in Samaji County. To keep the site safe from potential looters and curious people with metal detectors, the exact location is being kept a secret for now. Ancient Fashion When archaeologists began excavating a burial chamber from the Ming Dynasty, they came across two coffins. One belonged to Lady Shu, mother of the Wang family, and the other was her husband. Inside the coffins, archaeologists found a surprising amount of clothing. An undershirt, patterned skirts, silk shoes, and heaps of other garments in amazing states of preservation. This was just in the lady's coffin. When they looked inside her husband's coffin, they found even more clothes. He had been buried with several different gowns and a luxury pillow sheet to rest his dead head upon. The clothing taken from both burials was of the utmost luxury. They were decorated intricately with gold thread, woven with patterns of flowers and insects. Even the shoes were embroidered with patterns of coins, chime stones, and square knots. It was all quite impressive stuff. In the end, the clothing dates back to 500 years ago. The Ming Dynasty lasted up until 1644 and was responsible for helping turn China into a global superpower. Thanks to these immaculately preserved coffins, archaeologists now know what fashion trends were like for the upper-class people of China during this period. An Unusual Treasure In 2020, a metal detectorist in England found an unusual item that has been puzzling scholars ever since. The item is a small medieval cross made from pure gold, unearthed from the banks of the Tweed River. It's very small, only about one inch in length. It had a hole drilled in one end so it could be worn as a pendant. It's also been dated back to around the year 700 AD, when this part of England belonged to the Kingdom of Northumbria. It was an important center where Christians gathered and worshipped. For this reason, cross pendants are not that abnormal. But this one is. What makes it so unusual is that the cross is engraved with runic script. It's the very first medieval cross ever found that has runic writing on it. When linguistic experts were called in to inspect the mysterious artifact, they were able to decipher the message. It was a name, indicating the cross belonged to a man named Idruf. He had inscribed his own name on his pendant, probably so no one could steal it and claim it as their own. But things get even more unusual. The name has never been seen before in medieval England. Idruf was not a common name at all, as no other record of that name has been found. Whoever this man was, he must have been extremely wealthy to afford a pendant made of gold. Even though this was over 1,000 years ago, someone this wealthy should have been mentioned somewhere in local historical text. But there is no trace of him. This man was a mystery. Living in England with a name that didn't belong, scrawling runes on Christian artifacts, a historical anomaly. Where do you think the mysterious Idruf came from and why was he so far from home? Let me know your theories in the comments and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Mysterious Buddhist Temple Archaeologists believe they may have just discovered the oldest Buddhist temple ever built, or at least one of them. It was found in the Swat Valley of Pakistan, in the Gandhara region that was once taken over by Alexander the Great. It was actually when Alexander conquered the region that Buddhist beliefs from the East began to mingle with the Greek beliefs from the West. Alexander essentially built a bridge between two very different civilizations. Archaeologists believe the temple came from the 2nd century BC, when Gandhara was under the thumb of an Indo-Greek kingdom. Archaeologists also say they found the remains of an even older structure beneath the temple, which could have come from 100 years earlier. It's shocking because this means the temple beneath the newer temple was built just after the Buddha himself passed away, sometime around 483 BC. We don't know who built the temple or when its first foundations were laid, but it's still extremely old and shows how the Buddha's influence spread far and wide even in the recent years after his death. The temple was found on the ancient road that once led to the center of the city, 
where a great 65-foot-wide stupa once stood. Sadly, the site is now the location of an electricity pylon, and the stupa is gone. Painted Men In Spain, a researcher stumbled upon mysterious paintings from 5,000 years ago while on the hunt for some lost cave tombs. The man, named Agustin Palomo, was looking through the rocky area of San Juan near Albuquerque where he came across anthropomorphic figures painted on the cave walls. There were also some strange symbols along with pictures of arrows and some depictions that looked like doodles. Agustin had originally set out in search of an ancient dolmen when he realized there were drawings all over the walls. What's really amazing is that nobody found these paintings until now. There are two other cave painting sites a few miles from here. The Maltravieso Caves are nearby as well, where researchers in 1951 discovered traces of human habitation from 300,000 years ago. In the 1990s, handprint stencils were found on the walls of the caves, thousands of years old. In the end, the researcher never did find his tomb, but he did find some of the earliest works of art in the world. He doesn't know exactly what they are supposed to depict. They look more like monsters than any animals that would have been alive in prehistoric days. What do you think the drawings are meant to represent? Fictional creatures? Imaginative illustrations? Tell me your theories! Ancient Egyptian Embalming Cache Archaeologists working with the Czech Institute for Egyptian Science recently discovered a treasure trove of artifacts from ancient Egypt. These artifacts all relate to the practice of mummification. They were found during excavations at the Abu Sir Cemetery and are some of the most remarkable embalming treasures ever uncovered. As you probably know already, mummification was a very important part of Egyptian society, but you may not know why they went through all the trouble of mummifying their dead, so I'll try to explain. Preserving the body of the dead was the only way the Egyptians believed the soul, known to them as Ka, could reach the afterlife. A person's Ka was thought to leave their body upon death. Then, the only way for their ka to return was if they were properly embalmed. If they weren't, their ka could not return to their body. That meant they could never live for eternity in the blessed afterlife. The archaeologists found 370 ceramic vessels, each one containing some material used for mummification. They also found empty canopic jars that were used for storing the most important organs like the brain and heart. It's one of the most complete sets of embalming tools found. This has given archaeologists a profound understanding of the step-by-step -step process each mummy went through after death. Ethiopian Megaliths The Judeo Zone in Ethiopia is home to the largest concentration of stone megaliths in the entire continent. They dot the landscape of southern Ethiopia and have been there for at least 2,000 years. Ethiopian researcher Ashinafi Zina managed to correctly date the stone monuments on a journey to the region in 2013. He and Professor of Archaeology Andrew Duff discovered the stones to be from 50 BC, instead of the previously believed 1100 AD. In other words, these stone structures here are extremely old. But just what are they, and why are there so many of them? It's strange because they rear out of the ground seemingly without reason. Tall monuments carved in a variety of unusual shapes. Some almost look like people with human faces while others are clearly shaped to resemble the male reproductive organ. And they are everywhere! About 10,000 of them spread across 60 sites. What really captivates archaeologists these days is that nobody knows who built them or why. It's one of the most understudied archaeological sites on the planet, not even considered a UNESCO World Heritage Site yet. Almost nobody knows anything about the people who lived in the region 2,000 years ago. Even these days, it's not exactly a tourist hotspot. It's in the absolute middle of nowhere, in a country most people are unfamiliar with. The stone monuments may have been markers for burials, but nobody can say for certain. The Unicorn Ring In 2018, a signet ring that once belonged to an English noble was discovered on a piece of farmland in Buckinghamshire. The piece of treasure is 400 years old, crafted in the 17th century. For some unknown reason, it was discarded and then lost for centuries. It wasn't until a man with a metal detector walking through the field heard a bleep that he dug the thing out of the ground. This was no ordinary ring either. It was pure gold, weighing over 20 grams. It was also shaped to look like a unicorn. It's literally a gold unicorn ring, 
a historic, one-of-a-kind masterpiece. Unsurprisingly, it recently sold at auction for over 20,000 US dollars. What would you have paid for this ring? Let me know in the comments! The ring also shows a coat of arms, which was able to be traced back to a man named Thomas Kerwin, born in the year 1602. That was in the final months of the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. Historical records show Thomas inherited his family's estate in 1664, then died in 1672. The real mystery is how and why he was separated from his family ring, an heirloom that to any surviving member of the family would no doubt be priceless. Thanks for watching! Remember to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about archaeological discoveries. See you next time! Bye!